A special application of microwave used for estimating surface wind speeds and directions over ocean is scatterometry. It is an active sensing technique, meaning that it involves transmission of a signal from space that is reflected off the ocean surface and returned to the satellite sensor. This module discusses the basic mechanisms through which scatterometry works. So far in this course, we've learned about passive sensors, those that detect radiation that is scattered off of or emitted by Earth's surface or atmosphere. Active sensors, in contrast, transmit their own signal and use the return power from that signal to infer some property of the surface. Scatterometers measure backscatter off the ocean surface. Emissions are no longer very important because the transmitted signal is stronger than the small emissions of the ocean surface at microwave frequency. As we will see, the backscatter changes as a function of the surface roughness of the ocean, which depends on, and generally increases with, wind speed. First, we want to define a quantity called the scattering cross-section, which is the sigma. At bottom right is a diagram containing a scatterometer at top. As we'll discuss soon, the instrument would likely not scan straight down, but this is just for illustrative purposes of the scattering cross-section. The signal transmitted is represented by the concave up black lines, and the piece of T is the transmitted power, and the return signal is denoted by the concave down red lines, and the piece of R is the received backscattered power at the sensor. The topmost equation is the power flux density of returned power at the antenna. G is the antenna gain, which we'll discuss in more detail in the next lecture series on radar, and R is the range of the reflected signal, in this case essentially the altitude of the satellite, or in a real case where you have a slant angle, it's the, the altitude of the satellite corrected by some angle. The total received power is a function of the effective scattering area at the surface, or this A sub EFF. <clears throat> and this total received power is the piece of R again. And so the scattering cross section, which is the sigma, is just the integral of some normalized backscatter cross section, or sigma naught, over the area subtended by the transmitted signal. So you can think of the signal sent out by the radar and it spreads out. Uh, conically as it moves toward Earth. And the area subtended by the signal as after it is spread out on its uh, trip to Earth is that uh, DA essentially. <clears throat> we can use this normalized scattering cross-section or normalized backscatter cross-section, sigma naught, to derive wind speed and direction because it is what depends on the properties of the ocean surface. In other words, everything in our equation for received power here is fixed. The gain, the power transmitted, the effective area, and the range, except for the sigma right here. So by converting power received to some value of the backscatter coefficient, we can back out information about the wind because it predominantly impacts the scattering properties of the ocean surface. There are two types, primary types, of scattering that impact sigma naught very differently. The first is called specular reflection. It is mirror-like and occurs when the sea state is very calm. It dominates when the incidence angle, or the angle off zenith, of the transmitted radiation on the sea surface is less than about 15 to 20 degrees. In the example on the right, the transmitted signal interacting with the ocean is shown in four locations. In three of them, denoted by the orange lines, the, trans, uh, the transmitted signal is nearly perpendicular with the surface of the ocean, and most of the transmitted radiation is scattered back to the sensor. In contrast, the red lines, the third from left, indicate a location where specular reflection does not occur because the path of the beam is not orthogonal to the ocean surface locally. And so instead of getting backscatter all back to the sensor, you get some scatter in other directions. The plot on the left shows us how sigma naught varies as a function of incidence angle and wind speed. 
So the wind, different wind speeds are denoted by the two lines and the incidence angles on the x-axis. <clears throat> the orange line is some unspecified wind speed and the blue line indicates a new sigma knot after increasing the wind speed some arbitrary amount. In the specular reflection regime, the backscatter cross-section tends to decrease as the wind increases for small values of the angle of incidence. The other type of scatter is resonant scatter, which is also called Bragg scatter. It occurs when some component of ocean waves has a wavelength that is equal to half of the scatterometer wavelength divided by the sine of the incidence angle. The n in the numerator of this equation for the wavelength of the ocean waves that would cause resonant scatter is any positive integer that denotes that a family of Bragg scattering solutions exist. Bragg scatter occurs when the backscatter of two successive waves of the wavelength lambda sub w are in phase with each other, thus increasing the power returned to the sensor. For small values of n, this generally involves short wavelength wind-driven capillary waves, since the wavelength of the transmitted radiation is on the order of a few centimeters. The diagram here illustrates what we've just said in terms of the equation at the top right where lambda w is basically the distance from ridge to ridge or from trough to trough and is related closely through the sine of the incidence angle to the wavelength of the radiation lambda. Looking first at the panel on the left at this slide, at angles greater than about 25 to 30 degrees to the right of this red dashed line and less than about 65 degrees, Bragg scattering causes an increase in the backscatter cross section as wind speed increases. The dashed black line next to the orange line is an example of backscatter cross-section as a function of incidence angle in a uh, slightly rough surface. The orange line denotes the new backscatter cross-section given some hypothetical unspecified increase in the wind speed for that same slightly rough surface. Therefore, at this range of incidence angles, in particular between about 25 and 65 degrees, we are able to unambiguously determine, given some transmitted signal, that the wind speed increases as the power returned to the sensor increases. Now, this is very important because for this reason, most scatterometers can, will scan off nadir in this range where Bragg scattering is prevalent so that it's straightforward to convert power to some information about wind speed at the surface. Shadowing and refraction of radiation prevent scatterometers from operating at incidence angles much larger than 65 degrees. <clears throat> to further demonstrate the point about Bragg scatter and operating in the 25 to 65 degree range, the panel on the right shows for various incidence angles, shown by these numbers here, an increase in wind speed decreases the cross-section, the backscatter cross-section generally. This is true for low incidence angles like zero degrees. While for incidence angles greater than 20 degrees, the opposite is true and the wind speed causes increasing backscatter plotted on the y-axis. Shown are some potential scattering patterns in orange arrows for a given transmitted signal shown in blue for a variety of different sea surface states. The incoming signal is at a steep angle so that it can detect the backscattered Bragg reflection. For the smooth surface in the top left, specular reflection dominates and most of the radiation is forward scattered away from the sensor. In this case, the scatterometer would receive little to no power from the transmitted signal and could deduce light winds. As we move from top right down to the bottom row, the wind speed increases and the roughness of the surface increases as well. With more Bragg scatter occurring, the return power to the sensor increases, this orange arrow pointing backward, and the increased power can be interpreted as increased wind speed. Scatterometers also report wind direction. To do so requires viewing the same scene from two or more angles. 
Suppose we have some sort of scene like shown on the left here, with the wind blowing from the bottom to the top of this image. The wind-driven wave crests and troughs will tend to be oriented along the direction of the wind flow. If a scatterometer is upwind or downwind of the scene, it will detect maximum backscatter via the mechanisms described before. The return power will be slightly larger if viewed from downwind because capillary waves and foam formation are preferred on the downwind side of wind-driven waves. If the scatterometer views the scene in a direction perpendicular to the wind, the backscatter cross-section is relatively small, and so is the received power. When the scatterometer detects a single value of return power, it does not know what the wind direction is. It doesn't know where it's located relative to the wind direction. We're only able to derive some value of sigma naught from the power received. So let's suppose an instrument receives power consistent with a backscatter cross-section of minus 11 dB, as noted by the dashed blue line on the figure at the right. We don't know the azimuthal angle that the transmitted signal has relative to the wave crest and troughs. We could be observing a strong wind speed that would increase sigma naught and an angle orthogonal to the waves that would decrease sigma naught. So that would be along these areas where you'd have the, the cross viewing angle. Or we might be looking at a lower wind speed at an angle that is either upwind or downwind, closer to parallel with the waves, such as this spot and this one over here. Each black line on this panel represents a family of possible backscatter cross-sections and azimuth angles relative to upwind. By following the blue line across minus 11 dB, we see it crosses two black lines, plus an infinite number of lines not shown between them. <clears throat> we could, for example, be looking at a 7 meter per second wind viewed from upwind, seven and a half or so meter per second wind viewed from downwind or roughly 10 meter per second wind viewed from across the wind direction. All of those instances would give us the same value of sigma naught that we get from the power received. So given just some single view from some angle theta, which we'll call the azimuthal angle, uh, essentially the angle of which the satellite uh, view angle is making with the wind direction, we could come up with a solution like what we just saw, one of which is shown here. Now shown as a plot of wind speed on the y-axis as a function of wind direction, given some value of sigma naught, which is a function of uh, the azimuthal angle. By itself, this graph is rather useless because any of the wind directions are possible and the wind speeds of between 16 and about 28 meters per second are possible. So we need another view angle to constrain our solution and reduce this ambiguity. If we add a second view, then the only possible solutions are where the two curves intersect. So this might be viewed at an angle that's 90 degrees different from the original view angle. Those two lines only intersect now in four locations, greatly reducing the ambiguity. By adding a third or even fourth view, we further reduce the ambiguity and close in on a solution. Many scatterometers only use two or three view angles and rely on observations and model analysis to discard one or two of the possible solutions. The Advanced Scatterometer, or ASCAT, is aboard the UMET-SET METOP series of satellites. It scans in two off nadir swaths at the same time, where the nadir is underneath the orange arrow, and the swaths that are sampled are the lighter shaded areas to the side. It scans at an angle of 29.3 degrees off nadir, both to the east and the west of the satellite at the same time. In each swath, three signals are transmitted. One at 45 degrees ahead of the satellite, one perpendicular to the flight track, and one at 45 degrees behind, and at the same time you're getting the same on the other side of the satellite as well. 
As the satellite moves along its track, in this case from south to north in this example, all three beams observe the scenes in each viewing swath. So at this point up here, the 145 degrees ahead would sample it first, then the one uh, angle of 90 degrees, then one at an azimuthal angle of 135 degrees. So we would get three views of the same location from three different angles. This helps us to reduce or eliminate the ambiguity. Some more information on various scatterometer platforms, past, present, and future, can be found at the bottom link here. Some real-time data can be accessed at the top link, and I'll show you just a little example of that right now. This example was taken from the first link on the previous slide, and shown here. This is from the ASCAT instrument on MEDOP A. Warmer colors indicate stronger winds, but we will have to zoom in to see the wind direction. A single scan along the ascending node is circled in black. Note that at the center of this ellipse, an empty sector is present, which occurs at near nadir angles where Bragg scatter would not contribute to the back scatter. And instead we see the two swaths. Finally, we can zoom into a region to see wind vectors, which in this example is shown for off the California coast. Now in this example we see northerly to northeasterly surface winds depending on the location, with strongest wind speeds found at the time just offshore in Northern California at the top of the image. Again, areas with missing data, like here or over here, are either within 29.3 degrees of nadir or between successive passes, each further to the west than the previous. Although not shown in these examples, scatterometer data can also be rain contaminated. This happens when liquid water scatters a large amount of the transmitted signal, weakening the return signal to the sensor. Such vectors are usually denoted somehow on real-time data, perhaps by using a different color, although they are more common at higher frequency scatterometers, such as those that operate at KU band near 13.4 GHz, than those like ASCAT, which operate in C band near 5.25 GHz and are less susceptible to scattering.